<laughs> um, welcome to our Facebook Live event for tonight. Tonight's topics are going to be after the FAFSA, but last week, if you tuned in live with us, we were um, recording live from a FAFSA workshop at Wheeling High School, which was awesome because we got to do the Facebook Live event, and then we got to jump in and help out with the uh, FAFSA workshop. The only problem was that our recording did not work from uh, the Facebook Live event last week. So we, what that means is if you weren't able to tune in live, unfortunately, we don't have the recording of last week's session, which is when we talked about dependency. Well, we have it. It's just very grainy. I don't know that anybody's going to want to watch. It's not a great look. Yeah. It's not a great look. But um, so we figured we would start this session out by covering um, just kind of a recap of dependency in case that was something that you were um, really interested in learning about. And then we'll move into the after the FAFSA piece. Um, so with dependency, on the FAFSA, it is very cut and dry, and dependency is referring to whether or not a student will need to include parental information on their FAFSA or not. So with dependency on the FAFSA, like I said, it's very cut and dry. There's a list of 13 questions, and if the student is able to answer yes to any one of the, those 13 questions, that means that they are considered dependent and will not need to provide parental information. On the other hand, if a student is completing those dependency questions and they um, answer no to all of them, so there's none of them that they could answer yes to, that means that the student is dependent, so they must provide parental information. With the dependency questions, Sarah, do you want to uh, go through a few of them? Yeah, but before we continue, I posted up the numbers where you can text us any questions. Oh, yes. You're also welcome to leave your questions in the comment section. Hello, Sam. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and or text us to any one of those numbers. Pick the one that corresponds to your area code just so that we can, we know where you're texting us from, but um, we'll get all the questions that you sent us in there. But we'll start off, like Katie said, with the recap. So the first question on the FAFSA is going to say, at least, and we're talking specifically right now about the 2021 FAFSA, just because that's the one that opened up on October 1st. So the FAFSA, will, uh, the first question will say, and the dependency question, were you born before January 1st, 1997? And that's because up until the age of 24, you are required to provide parental information. Um, I know for other stuff, we might be considered independent, but for purposes of the FAFSA, we are considered dependent until the age of 24, unless we can say yes to one of the other questions that we'll recap for you. If a student is married, there's also a question that says, as of today, are you married? It's important to pay attention with any of the questions on FAFSA. If they say, as of today, it means as of the day you're filling out the FAFSA. So if you're married then, then you can mark yes to this question. Otherwise, if you're engaged, dating someone, you would still mark no until you actually get married. The FAFSA does not care about your Facebook status. So it might be complicated, but the FAFSA will not let you enter that in. Um, and one thing, and I don't know if you pointed this out, but one thing to remember is with any of the dependency questions, if you do mark yes to one of these, mm -hmm. you don't have to provide current info, but you will likely get flagged for verification. And verification is a whole topic of itself, but we'll t and we'll talk more about that in a separate week. But just be aware that you might be asked to provide additional documentation if you answer yes to one of these questions. Um, the next question on it is asking if you are going to be pursuing a master's or a doctorate program. So this question specifically asks at the beginning of the 2020, 2020, 2021, 2020, 2021 school year, will you be working on a master's or doctorate program? So this is things like um, a master's, a JD, a PhD, anything that is that requires you have a bachelor's, um, that is going to make you independent for purposes of the FAFSA. Um, the next couple of questions have to deal with students um, that are in the military. So one of the dependency questions asks if the student is currently serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces for purposes other than training. So if they are, they would mark yes and be considered independent and not have to provide parental information. Another one asks if the student is a veteran of the Armed Forces. So if the student is a veteran of the Armed Forces, they can answer yes to that question and be considered independent. However, with that one, it's important you pay attention to the notes because the notes say you have to be a veteran that was discharged under any condition other than dishonorable. So you have to meet both of those criteria and able to be um, enabled to, if you're able to answer yes to that. Oh my goodness. You wanna hit the other one, Sarah? Okay. Um, the next two questions will talk about students who have dependents. And so the first one asks, do you now have or will you have children but the question doesn't stop there. It goes on to say who will receive more than half of their support from you within the next academic year, which in this case is from July 1st, 2020 through June 30, 2021. And so it's specifically asking if you now have, or even if you're expecting a child, but you don't currently have a child, 
but also if you'll be the one providing the support for that child. If you answer yes to the first part or the question that says, yes, I'm expecting a child, or yes, I currently have a child, well, you can answer yes to that second part to say that you're providing the support, then you cannot mark yes to this question. You would have to um, mark no, and you would still be considered dependent. The second question is pretty similar, except it says, do you have dependents other than your children or spouse? And the other different piece with this, it says, who live with you and who are currently and who receive more than half of their support from you now and through the academic year. Again, the same dates, July 1st through June 30th, 27, or 2021. Went back, it's 2017. Yeah, uh, progressing, okay. Sarah. Um, so those two questions are for students who have dependents, whether they're children or dependents other than their children or spouse. And so that in that case, it would have to be someone that lives with the student that the student can prove that they're providing support for as well. Then um, another one of the dependency questions asks about um, if at any time since the student turned age 13, were they in foster care, uh, an orphan, or a ward of the court? So with that question, it's extremely important that you're paying attention to the um, at or after age 13, because it does not matter the duration of time that the student was in any of those circumstances. So it doesn't matter for how long the student was in foster care. What it's saying is, did this was the student in that situation at any time since turning age 13? So if the student was in foster care, even if it was only for a day, when they were 13 or 14, 15, any time after 13, they would be able to answer yes to that question. So just make sure when you are filling that one out or when you're answering that question, you're paying attention to that on or after 13 piece because that is crucial for that one. Um, additionally, the next question asks if, as determined by a court in your state of legal residence, are you or were you an emancipated minor? So with this question, any time in the dependency questions, they ask for specific documentation. The student needs to make sure that if they're answering yes to that question, they have the specific documentation that is being asked for. So in this one, it says, do you have a determination from a court um, in your, what is it, a court in your, your, legal, state of legal residence. in your state of legal residence that says legal guardianship, that says the student is in legal guardianship and it's to somebody other than uh, a parent or step parent. If the student does have that court documentation, they would be able to answer yes to that question. Now there's another question that asks, um, specifically, and I might have mixed the two. There's one that asks if you're an emancipated minor with uh, legal docu or with documentation from a court, mm -hmm. and the other one asks about legal guardianship with documentation from a court. Both ask for documentation from a court in the student's state of legal residence. So it's extremely important if they're answering yes that they are an emancipated minor or that they are in legal guardianship, guardianship they have that court documentation to prove. It is not my night for speaking. Um, and yeah, it's important to keep in mind, and the reason we stress the court order is because, like I mentioned, you will likely get flagged for verification and financial aid offices will want a copy of that documentation. And often we find students that are in some sort of legal guardianship with just a notarized document that does not suffice for financial aid purposes. It does have to be um, court ordered through a court in your state of legal residence. So just keep that piece in mind. And if you are, if you are a student or if you're working with a student or if your student is in that situation, and you're filling out the FAFSA now, just start looking for that documentation now because I know sometimes those documents are stashed away and uh hard to track. Yeah, in a hard to find spot. And so make sure that you start looking for those now so that come verification time, you will have those ready readily available and you don't have to be worrying about trying to find those at that point. All right, and then the last three questions on here are directed at students who are both unaccompanied and homeless youth. And so the question is essentially the same. The only difference is it asks who's providing documentation that shows that you are meeting that criteria. So the first question is asking if a high school homeless or, or school district homeless liaison determined that you were an unaccompanied youth who was homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. Keep in mind for FAFSA, it's not just asking are you homeless, it's asking if you're also unaccompanied, which means you're not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. The second question is asking the same thing, except it's asking if the determination came from the director of an emergency or transitional housing program funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the last one, again, same question, but it's asking if the documentation comes from the director of a runaway or homeless youth basic center or transitional living program. So if you have documentation that shows that you meet both criteria, unaccompanied and homeless, then you can mark yes on these questions on FAFSA, but again, remember, you will need to provide that documentation to your financial aid office.
And so that was a recap of all 13 of the dependency questions. Remember, when you are trying to determine whether or not you are considered dependent or independent for purposes of the FAFSA, if you were able to answer yes to any one of those questions that we have just outlined, you would be considered independent and you would not need to provide parental information. However, if you are married and independent, you do need to provide parental information. So that is one of the questions, the dependency questions asked if you are married. If you indicate that you are married, you have to provide your spouse's information as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, you don't need parental information. It would just need to be the student or, and the spouse. So now we're going to get into the after the FAFSA piece. So hopefully, um, you know, the FAFSA has been released for a while. So hopefully um, some of you out there have already completed your FAFSA because it released on October 1st. If you haven't, don't worry. There's still time. Just make sure that you get to it because some of those funds are first come, first serve. So that's why we always push fill out your FAFSA as soon as possible after October 1st just so you can make sure that you are um, eligible to receive all of the aid that you could potentially qualify for. But that being said, if you have completed your FAFSA, it's not, you're not just done. There's still some additional steps that you need to um, pay attention to and things to be aware of. And this is gonna facilitate for a very smooth transition onto whatever your next step is. And this is gonna help to make sure that anything that the college is requesting of you, you're on top of. So uh, the first big thing to know is just kind of to outline the financial aid process. You complete your FAFSA. Once you complete your FAFSA, as soon as you do, it's going to generate a confirmation page. So as soon as you hit submit on your FAFSA, you're gonna see this confirmation page. On the confirmation page, it'll tell you, um, it may have your EFC on there. It'll also t give you an estimate of if you qualify for any of the Pell Grant, which is a federal need-based grant, and any direct loans that you potentially qualify for, as well as additional information of what you had included on your FAFSA. That confirmation page, that appears instantly, and it's also emailed out to the email that you have on file. Two to three days after that initial submit and you've seen that confirmation page, you're going to get what is referred to as the student aid report or the SAR. This is like the official document. This is where you have your official EFC or um, it's going to tell you about Pell, any of the Department of Ed grants or any of the Department of Ed loans that you qualify for. Um, and again, it's going to have the additional information on your FAFSA. This one is just considered more official because it took two, th two to three days because it was processing. So it was verifying the information on there was in fact correct. And then you get that uh, SAR. The SAR will also have any information about any issues that came up when processing your FAFSA. So if there were any issues with data matching. Um, so your FAFSA, once it gets submitted, it goes through the central processing system, which matches certain key pieces of your FAFSA with certain agency databases to confirm that the data is correct. And so for example, it goes to Social Security Administration to verify that you are a U.S. citizen and that your name and your number um, match what they have on record. So let's say, for example, I type my name in wrong or my social security number in there wrong, there will be a comment on my star that says we were unable to verify this with Social Security Administration. So be very careful and for the most part you can make corrections to the FAFSA, but the one thing you cannot correct online is a student social security number. So that's the one piece you want to be absolutely sure of, just because like Kayleen mentioned, some of the some of the aid that's awarded is on a first come first serve basis. And so when you do make a mistake on the student social security number, there's only two ways to correct it. Well, there's essentially one way to correct it, but there's two things you can do. You can either correct it via paper, which is requesting a paper uh, SAR that gets sent to you via regular snail mail. You have to actually write on the form, submit it back via regular mail, and then wait for that to get processed or you can start a new FAFSA how, because now you'll be starting it with the correct one. However, if you, if you are starting a new FAFSA, you'll just want to be mindful of when you're doing this just because depending on what part, what time of the year it is and whether some aid is gone or not, you might be putting yourself in a tough spot. So just be super careful with the social security number for the student section because that's the one piece that you cannot come back and correct. Everything else though, if you have any other errors, so if you were, um, you know, uh, filling out your FAFSA and you thought, oh shoot, like I thought that I was, you know, going to add a school and I didn't add a school that I want my FAFSA sent to, or if you realized, oh, you know, my mom is remarried and I forgot to include stepdad's information and I have to include his information, whatever the case may be, you can always go in and make a correction online. So if you do have a correction and there's something that you realized I incorrectly indicated on my FAFSA, you can go back in and you can make that correction online. When you are doing that, um, as Sarah had mentioned, the only thing that you can't change is the student social security number. So with that one, be super, super careful because otherwise that's just a more intensive process of having to do the paper SAR, correcting it there. But everything else can be corrected online. Um, it's also extremely important too. The FAFSA, as Sarah had mentioned in the dependency questions, it asks a few 
that are as of today. If you change any of your answers when you're making a correction to the as of today questions, it's going to flag you for verification because it doesn't want those numbers to be updated because those are things that fluctuate. So for example, one of the as of today questions are, as of today, what is the current balance of the student's cash checkings, checkings and savings? So it wants to know as of the date that you were filling out, how much you had in cash checkings and savings. So if you're filling out your FAFSA and then you think, oh, the next day, you know, rent hits or something, and so there's less money in there and you're like, oh, I need to make a correction because the amount has changed, it's going to be a trigger for verification because the reason those questions are as of today is because those are things that fluctuate. They know it fluctuates, so they just say, give it to us as of the day you filled out the FAFSA. So if you do make a change to any of those as of today questions, they are going to flag you for verification on that because those are not intended to be updated on a regular basis. Um, so it's only if in information is incorrect that you would want to uh, make that correction or if you, you know, accidentally included something in there that was not intended to be reported. And one quick reminder, in order to get your SAR, you do need to, well, in order to get a notification about your SAR being ready, you do need to provide an email address like Healy mentioned. Make sure it's appropriate because all the schools you list on FAFSA, if you're the student, it will be sent to all those schools. They can see your email and any other information you do provide on the FAFSA. Make sure you're using a professional email, not just for the FAFSA, but for all of your college admissions applications. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, if you have your personal email, that's totally fine, but then I would suggest if, if your personal email isn't the best one to share with colleges, then maybe you'd want to create a separate one that you can use specifically for institutions and then just be aware of that and continuous, continuously check your email. I will say one of the biggest things we tend to see with students is after they've completed their FAFSA, they sometimes forget to check their email, any follow-up correspondence, anything that comes via regular mail, make sure you're opening that as well because sometimes you will get notifications via mail if they're unable to reach you via email. Let's say you mistyped your email but you, they have your address, you might get communication that way. So just be careful. Make sure you're keeping on top, or you're staying on top of any mail, email, any deadlines, things like that. Um, especially once you've been admitted to the to an institution, generally they'll give you a username and password to access some sort of portal within their uh, school website. And so they'll usually have a to-do list for you there. And a lot of times we see that students forget, didn't pay attention. Um, I was one of those students when I got accepted to college, I was like, great, got accepted to college, stashed away my acceptance letter, didn't realize there's a username and password there uh, for me to log in and visit, uh, revisit my to-do list. And sometimes verification is a part of that to-do list that a lot of students tend to leave uh, incomplete or just following up on additional documentation, things like that. And with um, the professional emails, if you want, if you're looking for a place to start with that, first name, last name, keep it super professional, super simple. Might have to throw some numbers in if you have a more common name, but uh, yeah, as Sarah had mentioned, really be aware of that because that is something schools can see, and so that is something that they will factor into, you know, admissions if there's a whether or not there's a professional email that could that could tip the scales in an unfavorable way. I'm sure if they found an email that they were not uh, that was less than appropriate. Um, so then after, um, as what did what part did we get through? So you'll get that SAR. Mm -hmm. Right, you'll get the SAR two to three days after the FAFSA has been submitted, and then you will be notified um, at some point uh, from the schools if you have been selected for verification. So Sarah kind of alluded to this before, and I know we're going to talk about this more in another one of our Facebook Live events, but just to give kind of a, a brief descriptor of uh, verification, it's when um, verification is essentially, it's a hold on the student's financial aid. The financial aid office at a college will do this, and they'll say, okay, we're placing a hold on your financial aid until we get uh, the specific documents that we're, request we're requ requesting. And with those documents, what they'll do is whatever document that they request, say they ask you for your W-2s, they'll just take your W-2s and they'll make sure that the number on your W-2 matches up with the number that you indicated on the FAFSA. So it's a way of essentially quality control for the financial aid offices just to make sure that people are reporting information correctly and that aid is be get, being given out to the students that do in fact qualify for it. This can happen randomly, so a lot of schools, there is a random verification rate in place, so they say, okay, we have to randomly verify 20% of our applicants. Um, so just keep that in mind. It doesn't necessarily that you mean that you've like done something wrong or that it's like an audit on your, on your FAFSA, but with, it, with that being said, if you are selected for verification, it's a hold on your financial aid, and you will not get out of that verification until you provide them the documentation you're requesting. So I always compare it to the TSA, it's if you are, if you've ever been in an airport and you've ever flown anywhere and say you're going to board the plane and they do one of the random checks and they say, excuse me, can I check your bag? You can't say no thanks and then get on the plane. 
if you say no thanks, they're gonna say, okay, get out of the airport, you're not flying anywhere. So uh, verification is the same way. They're gonna ask you for the specific documents. If you do not give them the documents that they have asked for, you are not going to you know, get financial aid. So it is extremely important, and that's why Sarah said to check your emails, because they will notify you typically via email or via your student portal um, that you've been selected for verification, and you will not be eligible to receive any of your financial aid until that's taken care of. So that's a very crucial point. And one quick tip is if you are looking at your confirmation page, when you look at your EFC, your expected family contribution, this is the number that the FAFSA has generated to determine that this is what your family can afford to contribute. It's the top right hand corner. Yeah, if there is an asterisk, like a little star next to your EFC, that means the system has already flagged you for verification. If you are one of the lucky people that doesn't have a little star next to your name, um, you might not be lucky. <laughs> the system just didn't randomly select you for verification, but the university can still select you for verification if they feel you know there might be conflicting information or it might just be part of their policy that they have in place to verify X number of students. And so just keep that in mind, but that's a good place that you can start and just so you know in advance if you're applied for verification by the system itself, you'd be able to have that as you'll you'd be able to see that asterisk next to your EFC on the confirmation page. And again, it's not something to get freaked out about. It's super common. I was selected for verification three of my four years of college. It was the same song and dance every time. I saw that I was selected. Whatever the documents were that they were asking for, I'd provide it to the financial aid office. And then a week later after they reviewed it, I would get my financial aid move right along as normal. So it's just really important. Don't get freaked out about it, but just realize that if you have been selected for verification, you do have to provide them the documentation in order to be able to move on. Um, so then after um, verification will happen, at some point typically it occurs in very late winter to spring. So uh, financial aid offices, the FAFSA date moved to October 1st relatively recently. So financial aid offices at colleges have still been adjusting to trying to getting those award letters out quicker because before they used to come more into the late spring. So they're starting to get better. You might start to get ver um, uh, notified of verification from schools like starting in November, December, but that can happen all the way through the spring. So it's really important if you do get flagged for verification, just make sure that you take care of it because again, you will not be able to get out of it until after that. But once verification, if you've been selected, once you take care of it, or if you weren't selected, you just move on to this part, you will get your financial aid award letter from the college. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about the financial aid award letter and what's on there? Sure, and we'll also have a whole separate video on that. But um, like Elaine mentioned, you'll get award letters once you've completed verification and any other outstanding processes with the institution. You also generally don't get award letters until you've been accepted to the institution. So when you complete the FAFSA, we tell you that you know you don't have to know what schools you're applying to. If, if you're even interested in a school, you can listen on the FAFSA, and that's true. But in order to get an award letter, generally, you'll have to be accepted to the institution. So some schools work differently, but for the most part, that's, that's how it works. Um, but the award letter will include a summary of the financial aid that, the, that your school is saying, you know, this is what we have available, this is what we compile from federal, state, and institutional aid. So federal being any aid from the Department of Education, state, for those of you here in Illinois, would be any ISAC programs um, that you were eligible for, and then institutional aid needs any money from the school that you might be eligible for. So they'll combine all of those generally into what's called an award letter, and they'll make you this offer. They'll say, here's what we can offer you, please review it, let us, uh, and then let us know whether you're coming to this institution or not. And one thing to keep in mind is there, all of the award letters look different, so it's a little bit hard sometimes to navigate them or to understand exactly what each award letter outlines. Some of the schools will include a very detailed breakdown of their cost of attendance, which will tell you this is exactly how much it will cost you to come to our institution. And in addition to that, they'll show you this is how much we're offering so that you can figure out in an easier way if there's still a remaining balance, that would be an out-of-pocket expense. So some schools will have that breakdown. Other schools will just send you the award letter with the just the aid information. Other schools, you know, they all have a different layout. Some of them have additional information, like, for example, they might offer different aid or your cost of attendance might be different depending on whether you're staying in a single room, double room, in an, um, in an apartment. So those things will impact your award letter as well. But for the most part, it will include information on the programs that you are eligible for, including award amounts, and they're also usually split up by term. So if you're going for a full year, they'll split up the aid for fall and then for spring. That means that, let's say you get a $10,000 grant, 
you're using $5,000 for fall, $5,000 for spring, and that's how it has to be split up. You cannot borrow from spring to finish paying off your fall semester. Yep. It has it has to go to the designated term. And so we'll talk more about award letters at a later time, but you will receive award letters. You might want to check with your institution, the institutions you're applying for, to see what their timeline is. I know Kinley mentioned some schools have been um, sending stuff out earlier now that you know FAFSA opens up in October versus in previous years it was January 1st. Um, some schools still aren't able to do that just because sometimes October, November, December is still too early and a lot of their information hasn't been finalized. So just be mindful if you do get any award letters, sometimes it'll tell you that it's an estimated award letter. So just be careful, make sure you're reading any of the comments, fine print, details that are included on your award letters so that you're not surprised later on if something does change. Um, something else that we failed to mention too is sometimes we'll have students that tell us, okay, hey, because the FAFSA was asking for 2018 tax information, so if you're filling out the 2020-2021 FAFSA, it asks you to report the tax information for both the student and the parent from 2018. So occasionally we'll get students that say, you know, in 2018 my parents were married and now both of my parents are divorced. So the taxes show like the finances, you know, the income coming into the household, they're married. However, it's a very different situation now. Now I'm just living with mom and so it's only one income. How, what do I do? So in those situations, it's really important because the FAFSA does not give you any place to like indicate any type of special circumstance. But if you have some type of a situation where the information that is being asked for and that you have reported on the FAFSA is no longer indicative of the financial situation in the household, you can go to the financial aid office and request what's called a professional judgment. So a professional judgment um, is the authority of a financial aid administrator to make adjustments or override dependency on a FAFSA. So mm -hmm. in order to do this, though, the financial aid administrator needs adequate documentation. So what that means is if you think you have a special circumstance, you would go to your financial aid office at the college and you would say, I, this is my situation. Um, do you have any type of special circumstance request or what does the process look like? How can I document this? And then they will tell you, okay, a lot of schools have what's called a special circumstance request form where they'll say, okay, fill out this form, and then they'll tell you if you need to provide additional documentation. Once you do that, the financial aid office can then decide if they can adjust anything or if they're able to adjust anything on your um, FAFSA, mm -hmm. and, or if they're able to adjust dependency on your FAFSA. So if they're able to make you independent, even though the FAFSA says that you are dependent and have to provide parent information. But the key is every financial aid office, it is at the discretion of the financial aid administrator as to whether or not they're able to make those adjustments. So it's extremely important, <coughs> excuse me, it's extremely important that uh, the student goes to the financial aid office at all of the colleges that they are interested in um, when looking for that. We do have one question, I'm going to check a little bit just to make sure I get the question answered and I'll respond via text as well to the person that sent it in. But it says, when I, when I filled out FAFSA Forecaster, it gave me the, an EFC that was half of, my, of the actual one from FAFSA. Is this normal? And so the EFC, for, or the FAFSA Forecaster, for those of you that are not familiar, is a website where you can get an estimate of what your expected family contribution might need, and then you're able to get an idea of, you know, different types of federal aid that might be available to you. Um, FAFSA Forecaster does tell you that it's just an estimate for eligibility for federal student aid, so when you do start, be mindful that it is almost like an extremely shortened version of the FAFSA. It doesn't ask you nearly as much information so there is potential for the information to be different than what it it ends up being um, once you actually complete a FAFSA. It's hard to say whether you know half of the EFC is is normal or not it depends on the information that was provided especially if you completed a FAFSA forecaster with estimated data before taxes were filed or something has changed in the family situation um, so FAFSA forecaster is a cool, good tool and there are a number of different resources out there from both the Department of Ed and from ISAC as well. Just be mindful going in that these are estimates and so don't be prepared for some stuff to be to change. There's also other stuff that goes into this, um, into these predict, predictive tools. So for example, they're using reference to the FAFSA. The FAFSA gets, the FAFSA formula has to be approved every year again. So sometimes things within the formula itself will change and that could also impact your EFC. So even if your information was the same on FAFSA Forecaster and on the actual FAFSA, some of that data might change. So I'll reply to the text as well, but just be mindful of that information. I think she's doing better. I'm back, sorry, I was coughing. Um, 
so we're talking about FAFSA Forecaster, and I was letting them know that, you know, it's a useful tool, but always be mindful that a lot of these will provide estimated information. Did you mention the map one as well? Oh, no, you can talk about that one. Um, so on ISAC's website, we also have a map estimator. I believe that's what it's called, mm -hmm. correct? Um, so if you go to the student portal, with the map estimator, you're able to plug in your EFC and your dependency status, and it's going, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to let you know whether or not um, it's going to give you an estimate of whether or not you'll qualify you for math. enter the school you're interested in. You can list it Oh, schools. okay. And with that, the reason you have to list the school is, again, because the MAP grant can only go to Illinois institutions that are MAP approved. Um, and that's also why it doesn't appear on your SAR. So you'll see if you qualify for the Pell Grant on your SAR, but you're not going to see the MAP grant because the SAR is only looking at aid that would go to any school in the nation. Whereas the MAP grant, again, that's only for Illinois MAP approved schools. And when we talk more about award letters, we'll talk more about these individual programs. But if you're not familiar with MAP, it is a need-based grant that is awarded to students in Illinois who will be attending school in Illinois at specific MAP approved institutions. So if you do get MAP on your award letters, this does, or you know you'll get MAP, you can only use this at MAP approved institutions in Illinois. So if you want to move to Wisconsin, go to school there, Indiana, any surrounding state, any other state in the country, any state that's not Illinois, you can't use your MAP grant there. So you'll want to be mindful of that. Um, if you are a MAP eligible student, just keep that in mind. Uh, for this year, I believe the maximum award amount is $5,340. So essentially, if you are a MAP eligible student, you choose to go out of state, that's totally fine. We understand you know, students want to go far from home a lot of times. But just be mindful that you wouldn't be able to use that money in any schools outside of Illinois. Yeah. So I think that is, do we have anything else you want to touch on? Do you have about anything on there? Cover. I don't think we have any other questions. So if you have any other questions, let me check before we sign off for today. Also, it's cold and flu season, people. Don't be like me. Drink vitamin C. I can uh, I'd start coughing again if we don't sign off too soon. Yeah, look. I think, nope, I think we covered everything. Um, and we will go more in depth into verification and award letters because those we could talk at length for. You and I can talk at all oh, about anything. That is very true. But uh, with those ones specifically, we could really get going. So uh, just keep that in mind if you have questions on award letters or verification. We will have separate events for that. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for today. All right, thanks for joining. Um, if you have questions, you can continue to text those in. Someone will answer during normal business hours. It's, it is a live person that you'll be texting. And if you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. We'll leave a couple of resources on there as well. And we'll share some stuff relevant to last week's video that was too grainy for us to Sorry. reuse. We are hopefully on a better network today. And so hopefully this video um, will be available at a later time as well. But if you have any questions, feel free to leave them up for us. Otherwise, we will tune back in next week. Thank you. Thank you.